Dear brethren, it is a privilege to be before you today via Zoom to present these talks. Your brethren of the Berean Bible Students of Michigan bring their love and are present with us in this Zoom call. This past January, I was asked by your class to produce a couple of talks on the subject, The History of the Truth Movement. This isn't an easy subject to approach. Where should I begin? What will be included? What will be edited out to confine ourselves to the time allotted? It wasn't until mid-May that I actually started to assemble a plan. Some items in that plan were dropped altogether as too long and involved, while others fell into my lap, so to speak, as the months progressed. These two books by Bruce Schultz and the late Rachel Devine contain extensive, relatively unbiased materials on some aspects of this subject, but they are so detailed that hours of presentation would not cover them. They contain over 900 pages combined, and they only cover through the year 1887. In this part of the talk, we will focus on the life, times, and locations in the early life of Brother Russell through about 1909. His life and work have served us all in a positive way to serve the Lord and to grow into a love of God and His plan of the ages. We admit that much of what Brother Russell brought forth was knowledge that had been acquired by others before him, but he studied these points thoroughly pulled the various threads of truth together, organized them, and presented these truths in a logical manner that would open the consecrated and spirit-begotten mind to a much deeper appreciation of the Lord's Word and create a beautiful tapestry of truth that enthralls all of us. In the second part of this presentation, we will focus on the magnitude and types of witness work that were carried out and the events surrounding the death and funeral services for Brother Russell. We are going to start somewhat before Brother Russell's day. In the century before, the Lord was laying an infrastructure that would allow everything to be in place at the time when Jesus would return. The Industrial Revolution is considered to have been from 1760 to 1840. The Newcomen engine, which is in the Henry Ford Museum, is thought to be the oldest steam engine still intact. It was built before 1750. It was used to pump water out of a mine in England. This was the primary and first use of steam engines. It wasn't until nearly a century later that steam engines were used to power locomotives. In this photo, we see the DeWitt Clinton train, which was built in 1831, and another view of it alongside the Allegheny locomotive, which was built in 1941, and was used to haul coal in and around Pennsylvania. The entire DeWitt Clinton train was shorter than the Allegheny locomotive, which is 125 feet long. The Industrial Revolution had several outcomes, but one of the most important was the development of assembly lines and the creation of interchangeable parts for everything that was made thereafter. This photo shows some of the machines that were used on assembly lines that were created for the mass machine production and weaponry and watches. Also, Machines were made that would manufacture machine-made furniture and fabric. These machine tools made it possible to produce multiple duplicate parts, which in turn made it possible to just grab a kneaded gear from a bin of them to replace a worn gear, or a new barrel for a rifle, etc. In addition, this land of America was being prepared for a work that could not have been done in any other country prior to 1914 because the nations of Europe were ruled by kings and their amalgamated church connections. It is certain that the truth message would have died if it had come from any other English-speaking country in the late 1800s, as church and state were still amalgamated in Europe. What was happening in the early days of our story? The 1830s. August 7, 1831, American Baptist minister William Miller preached his first sermon on the Second Advent of Christ in Dresden, New York, launching the Advent Movement in the United States. October 22, 1844, the second date predicted by the Millerites for the second coming of Jesus led to the great disappointment. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, denominated the Christian religion today, believed this date to be the starting point of the investigative judgment just prior to the second coming of Jesus. Thomas Edison was born February 11th of 1847. He would live to the age of 83, dying on October 18th, 1931. 
This picture is of Thomas Edison at the age of five in 1852, the same year that Brother Russell was born. In the time that he was inventing, from 1869 to 1931, Edison would acquire 1,093 patents, about 400 of which had their genesis in the Menlo Park, New Jersey laboratory that has been rebuilt in Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. In 1877, Edison's machinists produced the first model of his tinfoil phonograph, which recorded and played back sound. In 1878, he had a successful light bulb, but it required platinum for its filament, seen in the lower center photo. By October 21, 1879, he had a successful carbon filament light bulb operating in his lamp. On the right is the light bulb that Edison built over the days of October 18th through 19th of 1929, a couple of days before the 50th anniversary of the light bulb on October 21st. This brings us up to the year of Brother Russell's solo publishing career, 1879. So we will go back to his birth and bring us up to the same date. Five years and five days after Edison's birth, Charles T. Russell was born on February 16, 1852. He was the son of Scots-Irish immigrant parents. His father's name was Joseph Little Russell, and his mother was Anne Eliza Burney. They immigrated separately to the United States. There is no reason known for their leaving the United Kingdom. The exact date of their immigration is unknown, but it was somewhere between 1839 and 1843 based on written records. The potato famine wouldn't happen until two years after Joseph's last possible arrival date. Anne Eliza Burney may have come to America as early as 1821 and as late as 1845 with her mother and father. The two families lived in Meadville, Pennsylvania at first. This was about 30 miles south of Erie, Pennsylvania. Then the two families moved 80 miles south to Pittsburgh by 1845. The 1850s census has the Russells living in Allegheny City's Fourth Ward. At that time, Allegheny and Pittsburgh were still frontier cities. The Russells' first child, Thomas, was born in March 1850, but died of whooping cough on August 15, 1855. Their son, Charles, was born on February 16, 1852. His sister, Margaret, was born in March 1854. She would be the only one of the Russell's children to have children. Joseph Russell's business ventures failed about the time Margaret was born. The next year, 1855, his son Thomas died at the age of five. In 1857, the family was living in Philadelphia, where Joseph was a grocer. A daughter, Lucinda, was born in 1857, but she died of scrofula on July 21, 1858. Scrofula is a tubercular infection of the lymph nodes in the neck. There was a lot of that going around Philadelphia, which was infected at about three times the national average. Today, we know that contaminated milk and unsanitary environments or parent-to-child transmission causes scrofula. However, it wouldn't be for another four years that Pasteur would do his microbial experiments and determine its cause. At the time, scrofula was blamed on heredity. If the Russells asked for the reason for Lucinda's death, they would have been told that. Another son, Joseph Jr., was born in 1859, but died of the croup on April 25, 1860. The family was unable to pay for funeral expenses until November 23rd, indicating further financial problems in the family. The mother of the family, Ann Eliza, moved back to Pittsburgh while Joseph stayed in Philadelphia to administer the business. She died on January 25, 1861, of tuberculosis, which was called consumption at the time. She died about three months before the Civil War began. Joseph Russell was exempted from military service as he was over age at 47 years of age when the war started. Joseph still had debts to pay as a result of his business failure, but Anne's last will and testament provided money to pay off his debts. The Russells supplemented their income through farming and keeping a cow. Brother Russell referred to this cow on question book page 158. Quote, We used to have a cow that we always gave the very best grass in the barn and the very best place, but she always thought the grass over the fence was better. She would break ropes and everything else in order to get over. End of quote. 
So in a period of eleven years, five children were born, and three of them and their mother died. Brother Russell was nine years of age at the time of his mother's death. We're going to break off the family narrative here and talk about the physical landmarks around Pittsburgh and Allegheny where Brother Russell did work in the early days. Charles and Mariah Ackley were married March 1879. At this time, they lived in a duplex on Cedar Avenue in Allegheny. From 1879 to 1883, they lived in this home on Cedar Street. In 1883, they lived in a home that was on the opposite hill from the Euclid Avenue property along the Perrysville Road. I was unable to find exactly where this home on the opposite hill was, as there are a lot of hills in this area. But you can see a bit of the Perrysville Plank Road on the right side of this plot diagram from the 1890s. This diagram shows, in highlights, properties that Brother Russell purchased from his father on May 23, 1884, for $12,000. Previously, they had been owned by Joseph Russell's brother, who was named Charles Taze Russell, but his middle name was spelled T-A-Y-S, not T-A-Z-E. He had been a real estate agent and owned some property in and around Allegheny. When he died, this property fell into Joseph Russell's hands. We're going to dissolve away the plot map to give you an aerial view as it appears today. The names of many of the roads in the area changed over the years. Today, what was Euclid Avenue is now Burgess Avenue, and what was Highland Avenue is now Russell Avenue. What was Clifton Street is now Chautauqua Street. There are two homes shown on this property, on Euclid Avenue, on the original plot maps. They're squared here in this aerial photograph. One was Brother and Sister Russell's home, and the other was owned by one of his wife's sisters, Laura J. Rayner. This ground-level view shows four homes. The one on the far left and the one on the far right are the homes that were on the plot maps, or homes that possibly could go back to Brother Russell's day. They owned the Euclid Avenue property for 10 years until 1894. In 1894, Pastor Russell moved into the Bible house, which we will get to shortly. This is a shot from a little to the east of the last photograph. It shows two brown brick homes to the east of the white homes we were in front of a moment ago. The one on the left is on the property that, by 1902, Brother Russell had put in the name of the U.S. Investment Company. Mrs. Rayner still owned the home on the right at that time. By this time, Brother Russell no longer owned the properties to the left, where the white-faced homes are. Now if we go back to the white-faced homes and turn around, we see another home to the left in this photo. This is on the back lot of the property that fronted on the next road to the south. Remember these two homes. You'll see the backs of them in the distance in the next photo. We are now on Clifton Street, one block south of Euclid Avenue. The home on the right is most likely the home of Brother Russell's father, Joseph, and his second wife, Emma. Emma, by the way, was Brother Charles Russell's sister-in-law. Yes, Emma was Sister Mariah Russell's younger sister, who married Brother Charles Russell's father in 1879, the same year that Brother Russell married Mariah. Here's a family tree. You can see that from this family tree that Emma was born in 1854 while Mariah was born four and a half years earlier in 1850. So, Brother Russell's stepmother was four and a half years younger than his own wife. The family lines get very tangled here. Remember that the two women were actually sisters, and that Emma is also Mariah's stepmother-in-law, as well as her younger sister. Now we are going to see how these properties that they were living in relate to the general Pittsburgh area. The composite photograph here shows an aerial view of the three areas of interest that we will be discussing. The upper one, in green, is what we just went over, where the Russells lived soon after they were married, as well as some of their family members' homes. We will skip over the central purple area for now and look at the lower, solid purple area at the bottom next. This is the business area in Pittsburgh. This is where Brother Russell and his father had their fifth shirt store, 
101 Fifth Avenue, was near the corner of Smithfield Street, just to its east, or the right side of the photo. The first photo in this trio of shots was taken in Brother Russell's day. The Fifth Avenue store was probably only accidentally included in this photo of a fire-damaged building in the foreground, to the left. The tall building to the right of 101 Fifth Avenue was the Pittsburgh Post Office. It was very convenient for mailing out towers and tracts, as the 101 Fifth Avenue address was the first address of the watchtower, and it was right next to the post office. You can see what happened to the area since that time. By 2005, the 101 Fifth Avenue store was demolished and replaced by a Wendy's restaurant. By the present time, this building and the buildings to the left were also demolished and replaced by a new structure that is now a source of fine wine and good spirits. The old post office building remained, which made it possible to find its location on Google Earth. If you were to look up 101 Fifth Avenue on Google Earth, you would find that this address has moved down the road due to changes at the post office. This was the location of the Watchtower offices until 1884, when the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was incorporated. By 1884, the central store for the Russells, which was their fourth store location, was in Allegheny, a short distance from the Allegheny River. This is a long shot looking south toward one of the many bridges that cross the Allegheny River for entry into Pittsburgh proper, which is now called the Golden Triangle. Here are various views of the C.T. Russell Gents Furnishings Shop on Federal Street. Only the closest portion of the building to the corner was their store. If you wanted to go to the watchtower offices at the time, you entered through a side door and went upstairs to the second or third floor. The building has been remodeled internally to combine three stores into one, so it is now a single establishment, Mullins Bar. Down in the lower right corner you can see a back view of the building, which shows the side entrance and the bricked-over windows would indicate where the stairwell goes. This is a view of Allegheny as viewed from the west. In the upper left you will see the Russell home identified. This is the duplex home where Brother Russell and his dad lived before their respective marriages in 1879. The next two slides show the 1990s and 2020 photos. Charles and Mariah lived in the unit on the left and Joseph and Emma lived on the right. After the divorce issues started in 1896, and after Joseph Russell died in 1897, this became a boarding house run by Mariah Russell. It provided her income, although it was still owned by Brother Russell. Returning to the view of Allegheny seen from the west, to the far right you will see the location of the Allegheny shirt store which we just saw up close. This is the fourth store again. Carnegie Hall is attached to the Carnegie Free Library. They are about two blocks from the Russell's home and a little closer to the Bible House at the bottom of the view. You also see the original post office building in Allegheny, very close to the Bible House. Here's the Carnegie Free Library. It was the first library where people didn't have to pay to borrow books. Adjacent to and attached to the Carnegie Library is Carnegie Hall, which was the site of many of Brother Russell's public talks, and it was where he was laid out for his funeral service in 1916. The hall is now named the Theodore J. Hazlett, Jr. Theater. This is as of December 15, 1980, when it was rededicated. Notice the sign that is posted in front of the hall. Here's a close-up. Brother Russell's use of the building was remembered in this way. Pastor Russell formed a Bible study group in Allegheny City in the 1870s, developed it into the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. It became the legal corporation for Jehovah's Witnesses. He lived in the Bible House nearby, 1894 to 1909, spoke here at Carnegie Hall. The Allegheny Post Office was only a short distance from the Bible House, as we just said. It is now a children's museum in the historic district of Allegheny. Now that we've become somewhat familiar with the surroundings of the early years of Brother Russell's ministry, let us take a deeper look at the Bible House. For this part of the discourse, I owe a great debt of gratitude to Bernhard Brabneck. He's a Jehovah's Witness who put together books about the Bible House and the Bethel Home. 
The Bible House, located on what was then Arch Street, was built and occupied in late 1889. It was used as the center of Bible student activity until 1909, when the operation moved to Brooklyn, New York, when the historic district of Allegheny was developed in the 1960s. In the area around the historic district, a road one block west of Arch Street was renamed Arch Street, and the old Arch Street in this area was renamed West Commons Road. North of the historic district, it is still Arch Street. Now for a little history about the Bible House. In the 1907 convention report book, Brother Leslie Jones described the Bible House. The building was a double-store building with three floors above the stores. The store at the left of the picture was used then for the purpose of folding and mailing, towers, books, Bibles, mottos, etc., while the basement was used for general shipping purposes. The store to the right was the showroom, where Bibles and other supplies were displayed in cases, so that the public could come in and purchase, and where visitors to the Bible House were received. Brother Russell's secretary usually occupied a desk near the window in the front of the store, while Brother Russell had a private office back at about the middle of the store, where he would come each afternoon, sign letters, etc. His main office or study was upon the fourth floor, off the living room. The second floor, in those days, was rented out for revenue, the third floor was the chapel, in which all of our sessions are to be held. The fourth floor was for Brother Russell's private study and the living quarters of the Bible House family. As you reached the top of the stairs, using your own elevators, you entered the living room. This was a good-sized room, and in it, the Bible House family had their daily worship with Brother Russell, as well as other gatherings. Off the living room was the dining room where a long table accommodated the family and many visitors. The chapel holds between three and four hundred people, and is practically as it was in the days Brother Russell used it, with this notable exception. When he used it, there were beautiful mottos in colors painted in every panel of the wall. This shows that the ground floor was especially busy and heavily occupied. This is the subscription department. Brother Hirsch, censured, has a typewriter. This was taken looking northwest, so the front of the building is on the left side. The camera was turned around, and you can see a bit of the stove in the foreground out of focus. Notice the large pile of papers that Sister Weber has on the left. This is a very busy office, where the subscriptions were taken care of. The mailing room. Some stood at their posts, others sat, all busy at their various jobs, putting address labels on the items that were to be mailed out, among other duties. Sales counter in the store. Notice all the Bibles on the shelves. Motto cards and plaques are in the showcase. Opposite the sales counter was the correspondence department. Here, thousands of letters a year were opened, and most were answered by these brethren. Items that required Brother Russell's attention were directed to him. To the right of the sales counter was the entrance to Brother Russell's private office. Looking at the photo, we see Brother Russell's desk, to the right of some translucent windows, the other side of which was, again, the sales counter and the correspondence department. Looking to the right of the prior view, we see the desks of the other workers in the private office. Sister Land, to the right, was Brother Russell's niece. The mail and express department. The windows in the background are in the back of the building. The doors on the wall to the right would lead to the steps, to the basement where materials were stored. Here is a general layout of the second floor. As you can see, most of it is empty. The rooms were rented out to other companies or groups to provide income for the operating expenses of the Bible House. On the left side of the second floor is the coal porter department, where the efforts of the coal porters were coordinated and where their reports were processed. You can see the office was brightly lit by windows along the front of the building as well as the north side. To the extreme left, through the window, you can see a little bit of the First Presbyterian Church, which was across the street from the Bible House. Behind the coal portrait department was the composing room. This is where type was set and proofread. Notice the cases of type. All of this typesetting work was laboriously done by hand. Based on the size of the layout boards, these look like they were for the old Theology Quarterly Tracks series 
eight pages to an issue in this case. The third floor consisted entirely of the chapel. There were 316 available seats. In this slide, we have two views of the chapel. The two brethren illustrated had their respective duties, which are captioned here. Brother Hennings would marry Sister Rose Ball and move to Australia. By 1909, they would not agree with Brother Russell's view of the New Covenant, and they would start a New Covenant movement in Australia. The windows in the chapel are along the north side of the building, and the windows in the front of the building are to the rear of the seating area, as we shall see in this slide. Here is a photograph of the Allegheny Bible students' class in the chapel. Stop for a moment, brethren, and consider all of the opportunities of service that these brethren had at this time during the harvest. Notice also that ever before them, at the podium, was the reminder that one is your master, Christ, and ye are brethren. God hath set various members in the body as it hath pleased him. The fourth floor was subdivided into six rooms, of which we have three pictures. The first is of Brother Russell's study. Several years ago, Brother Rodney Rice gave me the negative for this photograph. It is a five by seven inch glass plate. Consequently, it was possible to enlarge several sections of it. However, the photo of it we are about to see was not one of these enlargements. If you look in the upper left corner of this overall photograph, you will see a group picture. I wasn't able to enlarge this photo myself with any clarity, but this is a photo that came from the present-day Watchtower Bible and Tract Society archives. It is of the brethren who worked in the Bible House in 1902. Here is a colorized version of the picture with the names of the known brethren indicated. Here are two pages from Bernhard Brabeneck's book describing the chair that Brother Russell is seen sitting in. Sister Ruth Cunningham told me that Brother Martin Mitchell had acquired the chair from Brother Russell, and it became a part of Sister Mitchell's things that were kept locked up in the Dawn's headquarters. Sister Mitchell gave it to Sister Alpha Caturba, and she gave it to Brother Rick and Sister Ruth Cunningham. They found that after their latest move, the chair ended up in the basement. They felt it would be seen by more brethren if I had it, so they gave it to me in November of 2020. It needs some restoration work, but I haven't pursued that yet. It is nice to know that Brother Russell probably wrote volumes 3 to 6 of Studies in the Scriptures while seated here, as these were written between 1889 and 1903. Continuing around Brother Russell's study, we see a Bible opened on his desk. It's open to Hebrews chapter 10. Well, how do I know this? Well, look at the picture on one side, compared to the flat view down below. Sister Doris Lorenz gave me a Bible that she purchased at a used bookstore in Van Nuys, California. It has the references to volumes 1 to 5 and the Watchtower up to 1901 in the margins. It was an early form of the Comment Bible. Inside the cover it had the names of J.F. Rutherford, Mary Rutherford, and their son Malcolm Rutherford. The Rutherfords were not in the truth when this Bible was sold in 1902, so it is my guess that it was probably one of Brother Russell's Bibles that ended up in the Rutherford's hands. For a time during Brother Russell's lifetime, Malcolm was the secretary for Brother Russell, so it might have been his from that time forward. Malcolm died in Van Nuys, California, so it is likely that his books ended up in the second-hand shop that way. The other photo on this page shows an open Strong's Concordance. By looking at the spacing of the lines of text, and looking at the amount of open pages to the left and right of the book, I was able to discern that this is open to the first pages of the letter L. There is an intercom telephone to the left, and a framed item with scripture texts whose first letters spell out C.T. Russell. And you can see those scripture texts here, casting all your care upon him, to me to live as Christ, redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, unto us who believe he is precious, Surely I will be with thee, sanctified and meet for the Master's use, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, looking on to Jesus. Let us who are perfect be thus minded. The heart-shaped card behind Brother Russell's chair, hanging on the wall, had an interesting story that Brother David Namiski related to me. Bernhard Brabeneck related it in his book on the Bible House. 
brother david namiski knew the sister who sent that to brother russell she was told by other sisters that that is too worldly to send to brother russell she sent it anyway well look where it ended up he must have appreciated it in the bookcase at the left side of the photo are two copies of the international sunday school lessons they're pointing to at the bottom there the second is clearly visible as a 1905 release it is impossible to make out the first one's year this photograph was probably taken in 1905 or 1906 based on the two items that were dated in 1905 that is the year text card and the sunday school lessons book we also see a three-volume edition of the twentieth century new testament in light binding directly above the motto card which reads the lord is thy shade upon thy right hand the mostly obscured card in the upper right has the words thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth even as in heaven behind the flowers also on the fourth floor is the parlor that all the brethren who lived there were free to use. The small painting just right of center and low on the wall is Peace by William Strutt, and the small photograph on the same wall, up above the cabinet to the right, is of Brother Henry Weber, the vice president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society from 1894 to 1904. Here is a group photo of the residents and workers in the Bible House. There were ten beds in the inventory list of the Bible House in 1908, so some of these brethren didn't live there. I would suspect that only the unmarried brothers did. There are ten brothers in this photo, but I don't know if they were all unmarried. Some of the familiar names. Brother Frank Hall, who was a pilgrim in Brother Russell's day, number 17. Brother Isaac Hoskins, number 25. There might be others who you know. Here is the Bible House family gathered round the dining room table. Brother Russell, unfortunately, had his back to the camera. In 1909, the work moved to Brooklyn, New York, and the Bible House was sold in 1912 for a sum of $60,000. It was used as a light manufacturing plant. Some time later, it was sold and kept until at least 1939. It was from 1929 to 1939 that reunion conventions were organized and held in the chapel of the Bible House. There were also two ecclesias that met there in Pittsburgh at the time, two different ecclesias of brethren that, that didn't agree on all points of doctrine. Some met in the chapel, and some met in the parlor. On October 6, 1963, the Bible House was demolished. The Bible House and the buildings on either side of it were replaced by this apartment building. This photo montage at the bottom shows where the Bible House would have been if it had not been demolished. Originally, this was where I planned to break between the two parts of the talk. However, I found that this was only about 35 minutes long, so I'm going to pursue the move to Brooklyn, New York. In January of 1909, the headquarters of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society moved from Allegheny, Pennsylvania to Brooklyn, New York. As an aside, the New York Metropolitan Opera was an attraction after the move took place. Brother Fry told me that Brother Russell was given free tickets to the opera. Brother Fry also told me that rather than waste them, Brother Russell attended the opera and consequently learned a lot about classical music. Many of the selections he heard were later incorporated into the photodrama. The Grand March from Aida, the William Tell Overture, the Meistersinger, Jocelyn, the Dead March from Saul, and others are found in the soundtrack of the photodrama. The move to New York also gave Brother Russell more ready access to seaports, which he used for his trips to Europe. Like in the Allegheny, Pennsylvania Bible House, the work was carried out mainly in the Tabernacle Building. I won't go through all the departments again, just a few photos of the chapel, which was on the second and third levels of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. The photos were colorized by Bernhard Brabeneck, the author of the book on the subject of the Bethel. No one knows the original color scheme that was actually used. You can see listed some of the scripture texts that were used in the panels. The other side of the chapel had more scripture texts. The chapel itself, viewed from the platform. The podium with Brother Russell at the podium and the congregation seated. 
122 and 124 Columbia Heights. 124, on the left, was Henry Ward Beecher's home. This was known as the Bethel Home. It was purchased for $24,000. It was a three-and-a-half-story and basement dwelling. It was 25.3 by 60 feet. The lot was 25.3 by 150 feet, extending back to Furman Street, with a brick building added on the rear. It contained 16 rooms and three baths. There is a more complete description of the Bethel home in the 1909 convention report. This map illustrates the various buildings that the Society owned. Number one, down in the lower left corner, was the Bethel home, although number two was also used for brethren's dwellings. Number eight, toward the mid-upper right corner, is the Brooklyn Tabernacle, where the work was done. Notice also you can see in the back of buildings one and two, an additional building was constructed, which went up to Furman Street, and these were additional dwelling places. I don't know what the other numbered buildings were, other than their addresses, but I don't know what they did in those buildings. They may have been residences. This is the ground floor layout of 124 Columbia Heights, Bethel Home. The long parlor is illustrated in the two photos to the right. In the background of the lower photo, we can see a part of Brother Russell's study through the wide doorway. Here are a few photos of Brother Russell in his study. Brother Robeson is at the typewriter in the lower left photo, taking dictation from Brother Russell. For historical completion about the structure, the Brooklyn Tabernacle was demolished for road development in 1950. The lower photo on the right shows where the Brooklyn Tabernacle would have stood relative to nearby buildings on Hicks and Poplar Streets. I know that this portion of our service is short, but it will give us more time to discuss these features and others during our break time. I hope that this has been instructive and perhaps made it possible for you to see some things that you have never seen before regarding some of the more secular scenery behind Brother Russell's early years as the seventh messenger. In the second part, as we stated earlier, we will focus on the magnitude and types of witness work that were carried out and the events surrounding the death and funeral services for Brother Russell. <music>